Now we're going to go into some more detail of normal cardiac anatomy. And in this first session, we're going to talk about valves initially and then septal structures. So you all know better than I, because this is what you deal with in your day-to-day -day activities, that the atrioventricular valves, the inlet valves, close during systole. The arterial valves close during diastole. So if we draw a picture of the short, the, the uh, parasternal long axis view of the left side of the heart, a picture that you're all familiar with, during ventricular systole, the atrioventricular valves are shut, and that is why the atrioventricular valves have tension apparatus. The arterial valve during ventricular systole is open, and then, as you all know, during ventricular diastole, when the atrioventricular valve opens to let the ventricle fill, the arterial valve is shut, and it is the hydrostatic pressure of the column of blood that is supported by the closed arterial valve that determines its competence. And as we will see, the valves are iluted to fit their physiologic purposes. And this means that at both levels, both the inlet level and the outlet level, we find a valvar complex. And in the atrioventricular valves, that complex is made up of the annulus. So you'll be pleased to see that here, now for the first time, we have a ring. The working part of the atrioventricular valve is the leaflet. And then, on the atrioventricular side, because the valve closes against the full force of ventricular contraction, we have tension apparatus. The papillary muscles anchor an apparatus to the ventricular myocardium. So here, you're looking at the posterior surface of the ventricular mass. This is the reciprocal view of the parasternal long axis section. This is the left atrium the aorta, this is the subpulmonary infundibulum, so you're looking at the posterior part of the morphologically left ventricle, you see the fine crisscrossing apical trabeculations, note that in this otherwise normal heart there is a degree of non-compaction, and it is amazing when you start looking how frequently you see some degree of non-compaction, so we believe that non-compaction is a spectrum of the uh, compact layer versus the non-compacted layer. But what you see here, the reason I'm showing you this picture is to show you the components of the atrioventricular valve. So here the annulus, the hinge point of the leaflets which is coincident on the atrioventricular level with the atrioventricular junction. The leaflets which you see fitting snugly together, supported by tension apparatus, the tenderness cords, the tension apparatus then anchored by the papillary muscle to the ventricular myocardium. And then if all of this works properly during ventricular systole, this is what the mitral valve looks like. We're looking at it now from its atrial aspect and you see that it is snugly closed and that it has two leaflets. It has a mural leaflet guarding two-thirds of the overall valvar circumference, and it has an aortic leaflet guarding one-third. And these leaflets close across a solitary zone of apposition. And I use the word zone of apposition purposely rather than commissure, because again, commissure is very poorly used. A commissure is a line of junction, but when in clinical terms we talk about commissures, in the mitral valve we refer to the ends of the solitary zone of apposition, because in reality, in the mitral valve, there should only be one commissure. But you also note that in the mitral valve, there are any number of slits along the mural leaflet and these slits are like the pleats in a skirt, letting the two leaflets, which are of dissimilar length, to fit together so as to produce 
a competent valve opening, or rather a competent valve mechanism. If we open the valve, we can very nicely see these component parts, and we can see that in the normal atrioventricular valve, there is uniform support of the tendinous cords to the free edge of the valve leaflets. And then at the ends of the solitary zone of apposition, we have these so-called fan-shaped cords, which some have used to define commissures. If we then look at the tricuspid valve, we see that the tricuspid valve has three leaflets, as its name suggests. And if we describe these leaflets as we ought to attitudinally, we see, as I'll show you shortly, that one is inferior, one is septal, and one is anterosuperior. And then when the tricuspid valve closes, because it has three leaflets, there are three zones of apposition. So here are those leaflets, one positioned anterosuperiorly, which is the major leaflet, another one hugging the ventricular septum with these multiple tendinous cords attaching it to the septum, and the third one, at the moment often said to be posterior, which in reality is inferior or is mural, lying against the parietal wall of the ventricle. And they come together closes in trifoliate fashion. Now the fact that the atrioventricular valve is a complex is very well accepted. It is less well accepted that the arterial valve also is a complex made up of multiple parts. And those parts are first of all the working parts and as in the atrioventricular valve I think it makes sense to call the working part the leaflets. Some people call them cusps. A cusp is a point or an elevation and is part of the leaflet. The working part, I think, is best described as a leaflet. And then the other working parts of the arterial valve are the sinuses, the sinutubular junction, and the ventricular support. And all of these interdigitate to form a competent valvar mechanism, which we can conveniently describe as the art root. And the arrangement is very intricate. And we see it best in the pulmonary valve. So here is a picture of the right ventricular outflow tract that I've opened out through a cut along the anterior wall. You see that I have removed the leaflets of the pulmonary valve to display the arrangement of the musculature of the right ventricle and the arterial wall of the pulmonary trunk. Does that make sense to you all? And what you can see is that there is a ring in the right ventricular outflow tract that is here. It is the ring along which the arterial wall of the pulmonary trunk joins to the supporting muscular structure. And that ring is the anatomic ventricular arterial junction. This is where the ventricle stops and where the arterial wall begins. But that anatomic ventricular arterial junction is discordant with the hinge points of the valvar leaflets because they are arranged in semilunar fashion in such a way that a crescent of ventricular myocardium is produced at the base of each arterial valvar sinus and a triangle of arterial wall is formed underneath the sinutubular junction. So there is interdigitation of the semilunar hinge points of the leaflets versus the anatomic ventriculo arterial junction. And that is why the arterial valve does not have an annulus as a part of its physiologic mechanism. And it's exactly the same in the aortic root. So here is an aortic root that I've split apart and I've taken away the valvar leaflets to show you the arrangement of the aortic valve, which once more 
is arranged not in annular fashion, but in semilunar fashion. And you see that integral with one of the interleaflet arrangements in the aortic valve is the membranous septum. And these areas, the arterial wall extending up to the sinutubular junction, we call the interleaflet triangles. And it is these semilunar arrangements that permit the aortic valve, as you see here, looking down on it from the arterial aspect, to close in competent fashion with the three attachments of the leaflets at the sinutubular junction, and again, three zones of apposition extending from the sinutubular junction to the center point of the valvar mechanism. So as with the tricuspid valve, the two arterial valves close along the three zones of apposition extending from the sinutubular junction to the center point of our orifice. So if I bisect the aortic root and then I build up this valvar complex for you, there is a ring in the aortic root just as there is in the pulmonary root, but that has nothing to do with the attachments of the valvar leaflets. That ring is the anatomic ventriculo arterial junction. There is then a second ring which marks the distal extent of the arterial root, and that ring is the sinutubular junction, crucially important to proper function of the valvar mechanism. But the valves themselves are attached in semilunar fashion. You can then create a third ring, which is at the base of the ring, but the arrangement of the valves is such that the semilunar arrangement incorporates arterial wall within the ventricle and ventricular muscle at the base of each sinus. The third ring, which is the ring that the echocardiographer measures and calls the valvar annulus, is in fact a virtual ring and is a geometric ring that is constructed by taking a at the basal attachment of the leaflets. So the overall arrangement of the arterial valve is not so much a ring, but as you see here, a coronet. Which is why I would encourage you not to talk about the valvar annulus, but to talk about the valvar coronet. And the valvar coronet extends from the sinutubular junction to the basal ring, and in the middle of that we have the anatomic ventricular arterial junction. Which structure is the annulus? You pays your money, you takes your choice, but the bottom line in terms of function is that the valvar mechanism depends upon the coronet-like attachment of the leaflets. And Andrew will emphasize all that to you very shortly for life. So let's now move on very quickly and let's look at septal structure. How many septums are there? Well, obviously there is an atrial septum, but the key to analysis of septal defects is that between the atrial septum and the ventricular septum, we find a third septum. And that third septum key, as you will all know, to the understanding of atrioventricular septal defects is the atrioventricular septum. Now the septal structures are not nearly as extensive as they look at first sight. So here you're looking down on the septal aspect of the right atrium from above and from behind. So here's the inferior cable vein, superior cable vein, the orifice of the coronary sinus. And at first sight, here we have an extensive septal surface. But in fact, if we take a cut across this septal surface, which is the oval fossa, you see that much of what at first sight appears to be septum is no more than infolded atrial walls. And the true septum is the floor of the oval fossa and its antero-inferior margin. So it is the flat valve, which is the true septum, 
The so-called septum secundum is in fact infoldings of the atrial wall both anteriorly and posteriorly and are folds rather than septal structures. And the folds are even more impressive when you look at them superiorly. So here is a four-chamber section in an adult heart across the atrial septal area, right atrium with left atrium behind it, opening of the superior cable vein, opening of the right pulmonary veins, and you see this huge, deep infolding between the cavo-pulmonary junctions. And so it is the flap valve that is the true septum, which, over, which is buttressed anteroinferiorly by the anteroinferior margin of the oval fossa, another true septal structure, but the superior part, the so-called septum secundum, is no more than the infolded atrial wall, which is filled with fat. The atrioventricular septum is then another sec true septum, but here we need to distinguish between the true septal component, which is fibrous, and the overlapping of the atrial wall and the ventricular wall, which in the past we called a muscular septum, but which we know to be a sandwich. So here is the true atrioventricular septum. This is a close-up of the aortic root. There is the non-coronary sinus of the aorta. Here is the aortic leaflet of the mitral valve. And you see the crest of the muscular ventricular septum. And here you see the hinge point of the tricuspid valve. This is right side, this is left side. And what you see is that the hinge point of the tricuspid valve is dividing this fibrous part of the septum, the membranous septum, into an atrioventricular component, which is the true atrioventricular septum, interventricular component. Now, if you cut further back, and this is a view that will be familiar to all of you who are experienced echocardiographers, you see that between the left atrium with the mitral valve, the right atrium divided from the right ventricle by the hinge point of the tricuspid valve, there is this area where there is an overlap of the atrial wall relative to the ventricular wall. But what you can now clearly see that between the two we have this yellow stuff and this yellow stuff is fat. Wherever you find fat in the normal heart you are outside the cardiac cavities. And this is an extension of the inferior atrioventricular groove so that this area between the offset attachment of the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve, which in the past we called the atrioventricular muscular septum, in reality, as you see here, is a sandwich. When the bread in the sandwich is the atrial myocardium, the ventricular myocardium, the meat in the sandwich is the superior extension of the inferior atrioventricular groove containing extra cardiac fat. And all of this is now immediately evident to you when you do resonance imaging or when you do computerized tomography because you can follow the course of the atrioventricular nodal artery through this atrioventricular muscular sandwich. The final septum is the ventricular septum which has two parts, one fibrous, the membranous septum, the other muscular. In the past, we divided the muscular septum into component parts. In fact, that is no longer strictly applicable. We can divide the right ventricle into components, an inlet part and an outlet part and an apical part. In the past, we called the inlet septum. But in fact, as you all know, because the subaortic outflow is deeply wedged between the mitral valve and the septum. In fact, the inlet part of the right ventricle is separated from the outlet part of the left ventricle. So in reality, rather than being an inlet septum, this part is an inlet-outlet septum. And then, we used to call this part the muscular outlet septum in the normal heart, but as you can beautifully see in this parasternal long axis equivalent, in fact, the infundibulum 
is separated not from the left ventricle, 